Lance, it's great to see you. Pleasure. It's always a pleasure to see you. I know you'd rather be playing basketball this time of year than sitting talking to me. But when the season ends, what's the first thing you do when the next season ends? When the next season ends, uh, I like to unwind. Um, and I was on the first plane in New Orleans to go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to talk about your fishing because that's what you've been spending a lot of your focus on. But mm -hmm. just when you look back this last year's Knicks season, mm -hmm. um, what was the most difficult part about it? I mean, I know you want to win more, but Absolutely. What, what was tough? Um, it was tough to see our, our, some of our better players get injured. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Tim hurt himself early in the year uh, when he was rolling. Um, and, you know, obviously, Chris Tapps hurt himself as well, and it was a big turning point for our season. So I, I just think that the way that, you know, those things unraveled, it, it kind of put a, a dent in our season. Yeah, have you been keeping in touch with KP and his health? Yeah, he's, doing, he's doing good. good. I mean, he's, he's, he's rehabbing really well, yeah. and uh, his spirits are really high. So I, I have no doubt that he'll come back stronger than him. Another coaching change. There could be a coach any minute now. Yeah. Um, for you, this will be your fourth head coach with the yeah. Knicks since 2015. How difficult is that to keep changing to a new head coach? Um, well, I just, you know, we want to make sure we develop a great culture, you know, here because we have a lot of really uh, good young talent. Um, and, you know, New York is the biggest market um, in anything, not just sports. But, you know, with that comes a lot of expectation and, and you know, you got to produce, you know, so as much as it is a competitive market for players, it's the same for, you know, coaches and, you know, front office people. So they say they're done with the interviews. You have any idea who you think? I have no idea to do, be. Do they keep you updated or? They will if mm -hmm. something were to happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I haven't really been following it, to be honest. I've literally really? been on my boat in my happy place. So I'm going to make this analogy. This is our transition. Okay. Catching the perfect fish, like the best catch. Is, is it as dis difficult as getting like the best coach for the Knicks, which is harder? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I think they're both equally difficult mm -hmm. um, because in my fishing, I, I go for the, you know, the trophy. I'm going for the fish that's going to win a tournament. And in basketball, we got to go for the coach who's going to help us win a championship. So there is a good analogy between the two, but I think they're both equally difficult. <laughs> so when did you get involved in fishing? I've been fishing. Uh, it actually started in North Carolina when I was in Duke. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine named Ken Juan Nichols used to take me fishing um, in the lakes. And uh, I was like, where are you taking me? You know, like, what are we doing? And, you know, I had to put a worm on the hook and I had to touch these slimy fish. And New York City boy, I'm a City New boy. Jersey boy. I was boy, like, yeah. what is this? I don't, I'm not doing <laughs> this, you know. And years later now, wow. you know, I have my own fishing team. Uh, I compete along the Gulf, you know, coast. And I love it. And you just got your license to be a captain. Yeah. And that's um, rare for a guy your age, yeah. a young guy. So what did you have to do to get that license? Um, I had to be determined. <laughs> uh, the material was a lot. Um, but it was easy because it's something I'm uh, very interested in. It's something that I wanted to, you know, get off my bucket list. I've been on the boat, um, I would say, about five years now fishing mm -hmm. offshore. And it's just something that I always wanted. Any of your Knicks teammates or any NBA guys come out with you? Um, not yet, but I plan on getting a few of the guys to come this summer. They've been looking at a lot of the pictures and videos that I just show them all throughout the mm -hmm. season. So they're like, I'm coming, I'm coming. So we'll see if they actually do. But I'm excited if any of them wants to come. I'm pretty sure I'll put them on the fish. And you say that now you own your own fishing team, mm -hmm. and this is new. So tell me about your fishing team. My fishing team is amazing. Um, I would say the best part about our team is that we're really just boys you know we love each other and uh, we have fun while we're out there mm -hmm. um, obviously we fish really hard and we want to win and we want to catch the biggest fish but um, you know you can't take the fun out of the sport and uh, the fun is just the camaraderie with your boys and you know uh, we, we have a very diverse group uh, people from all over the you know pretty much all over the country cool. um, even international you know how many people do you have like on a fishing team um, right now, I think we have between eight and ten. Mm -hmm. um, we have some people, you know, uh, a lot of people have jobs and stuff, so it's really hard for the tournament schedules to match up with some of their uh, jobs. But um, we have about a solid eight to ten guys who are really into it, and we're trying to win everything. So where are these tournaments out of, and how do you get into them? Um, so the tournaments that we actually have coming up um, on May 16th through the 20th, I have the Orange Beach Billfish Classic, which is hosted in Orange Beach, Alabama. Um, that's the first kickoff for pretty much the tournament se series uh, of the summer. And then right after that, we have another one at our home port in Cypress Cove, Marina, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, that's called the Cajun Canyons Billfish Classic. 
and then we have another one in Mississippi, uh, the Mississippi, the Gulf Coast uh, Billfish Invitational. So we have that, and then we have the Emerald Coast Billfish wow, Classic. So, so we, we have a full summer, and uh, I just love to compete. So you're based out of Louisiana. Does that come from when you played with New Orleans? Or yeah, it uh, does. Yeah, well, my first team was the Hornets uh, before yes, they turned before to the, the Pelicans. Pelicans. <laughs> yeah, so that, uh, that was what I actually just kick-started everything, you know, being around all the water. So pretty much a way of life down there. You have a pickup truck and a boat when you live down there. Yeah. It just evolved. I went from fishing inshore to fishing out hundreds and hundreds of miles offshore. So it's, I never imagined this for myself, being from the city, but it's just, you never know what you're going to love. I love the city boy, and this is so with the pickup truck and the fish. Yeah. Um, Slang Magic Fishing, that's the name of your team. Where'd you get the name from? Um, the name was actually from a, a song. Um, that I loved. Uh, it's from a group called The Outsiders. Um, they're based out of North New Jersey, and uh, one. So of there their, is the ties back home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, they there was a guy named Slang Ton that was uh, in the group, mm -hmm. and he made a song called Magic. And then at the end of the song, he says Slang Magic, and it always stuck with me. That name was actually my AOL AIM screen name. No way. I mean, that's how far back it goes. I don't even know if there is AIM anymore. I know, no, there isn't. So, yeah, my, I'm surprised somebody so young like you was even involved with it back Yeah, then. I remember all that. I had to, you know, do the 56K dial up, and oh, I'd yes. be on there, and then my mom would pick the phone up, and I'd lose the it's signal. It's like, oh no, I'm on, I'm on yeah. mine. But that's how far back it goes. Yeah. The name has just always been something I really wanted to do something with it eventually and I'm you know I was like why not now you talk about being young and on AOL it makes me think about New Heights NYC you got involved with them um, we cover them a lot here on Fox 5 mm -hmm. how did that help your trajectory to not just be, you know you have to go to Duke first and then become a professional basketball player but how did that help you um, well it, it gave me a lot of mentorship mm -hmm. um, I was a part of something bigger than myself I was a part of you know a program where you know, it wasn't about them, it was about the kids. It was about, you know, helping develop the, you know, elite student athlete. You know, um, a lot of the opportunities that, you know, a lot of privileged kids get, you know, these inner city kids don't get that opportunity. And, uh, you know, the mentorship, the after school programs, the, the tutoring, you know, before practice and after practice, you know, they just really just help mold you into a student athlete, whether mm -hmm. how far you want to take, you know, the athletic prowess is, you know, that's on the individual, but we're going to make sure you have a chance to be successful in college. And I was an alumni of that. Um, and it's just an amazing thing over there. These guys are just so, you know, just so passionate and they want to make sure that these kids are successful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm living proof of it. And uh, I just, I'm ecstatic about the whole thing. It's evolved. I yeah. was involved when I was at its grassroots level, and it's just amazing to see 13 years later just how it just developed and how the alumni from the program is just so successful, not only in basketball, but in life. And I think it's just an amazing organization. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of the proceeds from a lot of the things that I do, I always give back to them. And I'm just a, a proud face of the organization, and I can just want to continue to help them grow. That's really neat. Then you go to Duke, mm -hmm. what's the, the one, uh, you say, biggest thing that you learned, or the biggest takeaway you got from playing for Coach Mike Giuseppe? Oh man, I learned so much from him. I think the one thing that I will always take away from him was to, uh, you know, the mental toughness side of when adversity hits. Mm. Um, I feel like I can't be blindsided by any type of adversity and it make me you know, derail. Um, I just think that's something that he just emits, which is just, you know, uh, just toughness and just perseverance and confidence. And uh, with that said, that was something that just resonated with myself. He always expected a lot out of me. Um, I was always a leader for him, even as a freshman. Uh, when I got there, he saw the potential to be a leader. And he held me to a really high, um, you know, standard as far as practicing what I preach, doing things the right way because he knew the impact that I had on my you know, teammates and that's just resonated with me all the way through my playing career. Speaking of resilience and just keeping that, that focus, so a challenge you went through coming to Knicks, you're with the Oklahoma City Thunder, mm -hmm. so through a series of trades and waves, you get to the Knicks on a 10-day contract. Yeah. What did you have to do during that time, Lance, to get yourself not just an NBA contract again, mm -hmm. but an extended NBA contract. What do you think you did to, to get to that point? Um, I would say I trusted my work. Um, that's something that I live by. I mean, that's one of my hashtags. But I, I just, 
you know, I had the opportunity and I wasn't going to, you know, look over my shoulder, mm -hmm. you know, look back. It was just you're in the moment. Everything that you've worked for up until this point, you're on the stage to do it. You have, you're actually on the biggest stage to do it. And um, I just went for it. You know, I'm a local kid and I grew up, you know, a huge Knicks fan. And, you know, wearing that jersey probably meant a lot more to me than most of the guys on the team. You know, it's very hard to, you know, be in the NBA period, but I think it's even that much difficult to be on the team that you actually grew up admiring. Mm -hmm. So I had a different, you know, mindset going into those 10 days. It was like, you know, I, I, the, I was playing for the pride of wearing the jersey and then, you know, everything else just followed. So you were captain of Duke, captain of the Knicks. Mm -hmm. Now you're captain of a boat, right? And any boat, right? When you, mm -hmm. whatever boat you guys are on. So what does it take? What kind of leadership mm -hmm. does it take to be a good, effective captain? Um, you gotta like doing the dirty stuff. You gotta like being able to, you know, uh, tell people the truth all the time, uh, regardless of the backlash or you know whether they want to hear it or not. You gotta be able to say it confident and you got to be consistent because you know you can't be a certain way with someone and then you know nice or different to someone else because people notice that and then you become like a two-faced person and you know good leaders are always you know upfront and direct and that's something that i've always been um, my teammates at every level that i've ever played at know that um, the guys on my fishing team know that um, and you know my family knows it so i mean it's just who i am i, I can't be any other way. I just don't know how to. And now you're also creating a whole docu series about all of this. So yeah. what's what's going to be in this, and where can we eventually see it? I know you're working on it now. Yeah, I have a lot of really good content. Mm -hmm. um, we we go out there, like I said, we have fun. We put a lot of fish in the boat, um, and uh, I have a lot of stuff right now that I'm editing. Um, we just we fish so much now. We the content's starting to stack up, oh, yeah. so we have a lot of work to do, but. Um, I plan on, you know, putting it on my website. Um, the website is actually launching um, Great. today. Um, With the team? Yeah, and it's um, www.slangmagic.com. Um, and the Instagram handle is Slang Magic Fishing. Gotcha. And my personal account is at Mr. Lance 42. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance 42. 42. And you had an incident I saw on your Instagram account mm -hmm. with a shark. <laughs> so what happened and everyone's hands and feet are okay? Oh my goodness, that, was, that was one of the craziest things yeah. I've ever seen on the boat. Um, we, were, uh, we were fishing, we were deep dropping, which is basically um, you know, putting a big weight on the bottom of the line. We sent about five hooks down with squid on them, uh, and we sent it down about 800 feet. And how big is the squid when you put it on? The squid is about this big. Well, okay, um, yeah. you know, we, we put five of them on and we send the line down with a little yeah. bit of lights you know, just to, for them to see it because it's really dark down there. Mm -hmm. And we sent it down and we got a bite. And we're, you know, we're reeling it up. And as soon as it comes to the surface, it's a fish called a king snake eel. Okay. And it was about nine feet long. I was going to say, those things are long, yeah. Yeah, and it was about, you know, this wide, the whole length of it. And as soon as we get it up, um, we see something, you know, a really bright blue flash. Um, and I was like, what is that? And a mako shark comes and bites the tail of this eel. And the eel immediately turns around and bites the face of the mako shark and starts to spin because that's what they do. They lock on and then they start twirling wow. to rip apart whatever it is. And while once it, it was on your hook? While it was still on the hook. It twirled on the Mako shark's face and it just ripped at it. And the Mako went crazy. It took off, it popped the line and we just were wow. sitting there like, <laughs> it was it was unbelievable. Like the, the video that we had, that I posted didn't do it any justice. Really? Like if you had to see it, it was amazing. Woo. And don't lose those hands and feet. Oh, no, I'm <laughs> definitely not. I was nowhere near that. <laughs> All right, so final question. And we're here at Oso. We're on uh, 140th in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. uh, one of your favorite places to come. They have fish dishes here. Do you cook the fish you catch? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I catch it, I clean it, and I cook it. Um, I love eating fish. Mm -hmm. uh, I always like fresh fish, obviously, because I, you know, I catch my own, but I definitely, you know, put it down in the kitchen with it as well. well any particular recipes or secrets or, or, or a favorite fish you like to eat? Uh, my favorite fish to eat is a yellow edge grouper. Um, okay. It's a fish that I catch down in the Gulf in about 600 feet of water. Wow. And uh, the consistency of the fish is like lobster. And the ingredients, the way I like to cook it is very simple. Um, I just like to do a light pan fry. I'll put some sea salt, some uh, black pepper butter in a pan and I'll just baste it until it really? flakes and it's probably the best thing. It's a simple, mm. simple recipe, delicious outcome. 
And then, so you know which fish go best with what dishes because yeah, of I your mean, knowledge. Yeah, I, I experiment. I like to experiment with it and see you know, what works, what doesn't work. Um, obviously, the ones that don't work, you don't hear about. But the <laughs> never existed, that, the never caught do, it, never cooked it. The ones it. that do work, um, they're, they're delicious. I experiment with it a lot. Um, I have a lot of downtime and I have a lot of fish to experiment with. So cool. I have a few recipes that actually are really good. So maybe we'll learn some stuff from the guys here at Oso as oh, we absolutely. round this out. Now anxious. you may be hungry. Talk, all this talk about eating fish. Um, Lance, this is awesome. Good luck with your fishing team. Thank you so much.